The philosopher Aristotle once said that every child is a blank slate, waiting for life's experiences, good or bad, to etch their mark. All of us did something wrong when we were kids, refusing to share, fighting with siblings, stealing from school. What would you think if someone said you were born bad because of those mistakes? You only changed as you grew up because you had a parent, caregiver or teacher who taught you it was wrong. And if you still didn't listen, you would hope they'd seek professional help for you. But what if the adults in your life didn't do that? If nobody stopped you back then, is it fair to call you a monster now? This show contains descriptions of violent crimes and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another episode of Prash's Murder Map. I'm your host Prash and today I'm really happy to bring you a case which was requested by one of my listeners, Marnie. She sent me a voice message which she agreed to let me play on the show, so let's hear it. Hey Prash, my name's Marnie from Adelaide in Australia and I thought I'd leave you this quick message to tell you that you're doing a great job on your podcast. I love your show and the unique approach you take to the cases, so keep up the great work. Um, I know we don't have many serial killers in Australia compared to some other countries, but I was wondering if I could be really cheeky and ask you to consider doing an episode on the serial killer Paul Denyer, aka the Frankenstein killer. I would absolutely love to hear your insights into his crimes. Thanks a lot, take care and looking forward to your next episode. Bye! Thanks so much, Marnie, for your kind words and the great suggestion. So fasten your seatbelts and join me on a plane journey down under to the Southern Hemisphere, to Frankston in Australia. Frankston was originally home to the Boonwurrung Aboriginal people, but as more European settlers arrived, the area grew and was officially founded as a small fishing village in 1854, before evolving into the busy suburb of Melbourne that it is today with a population of 135,000. Sadly, there are no surviving members of the Boonwurrung tribe, as so many were wiped out by the smallpox epidemic that the European settlers brought with them. Today, Frankston is a modern town with an attractive seaside resort and is slowly being gentrified, so it's a popular and pretty safe place to live. But back in 1993, local women felt anything but safe. Donna Vaines was enjoying a relaxing evening at home in February 1993. Maybe she was watching TV with her cat curled up on her lap to keep warm, her young child asleep in the crib, and her two kittens playing innocently at her feet. It was the picture of peace and harmony, but it wouldn't last. Suddenly, the phone rang. Donna tried not to disturb the cat as she eagerly reached for the receiver, expecting it to be her boyfriend Les. But as soon as she held the phone to her ear, she knew she was the victim of a chilling prank call. She slammed the phone down, trying to shake off her unease. But before she could forget the incident, more calls came, each one more unnerving than the last. After a few nights of her stomach twisting with fear, every time she heard the shrill ringing, she was reluctant to stay at home to face the onslaught of calls, so she went out with Les on his pizza delivery shift. It was a decision that would probably save her life. When the couple returned to their Seaford home, they were greeted with chaos. The whole house had been ransacked by someone filled with rage. A knife had been dragged along the walls and the furniture had been viciously stabbed. The words, Donna, you're dead, were scribbled on the wall in blood. It didn't take long for Donna and Les to discover where the blood came from. Her cat lay dead on the lounge floor, a picture of a naked woman placed on top of it. The two kittens had also been slaughtered. On the bathroom mirror was another message written in shaving cream, the names Donna and Robin. The most chilling sight was yet to come. 
Thankfully, the baby wasn't with Donna that night. I couldn't find any information about where it was, but it's possible that she and Les had taken the child with them that night, or it was staying with the father. The empty crib had been attacked with a furious bloodlust. Another pornographic picture had been laid obscenely on top of the crib, stabbed through with a knife, piercing down to the bedding material below. The child's clothing had been cut up and flung around the room. The police were called, and as they took notes, they asked who Robin was, but neither Donna nor Les knew anyone with that name. She had no enemies, and her ex-boyfriend, the child's father, wasn't a viable suspect, as their breakup had been on good terms. It had to be someone who'd been following Donna's movements, and knew how long she'd been out, as it would have taken time to do so much damage, and the criminal would have risked being caught in the act. Terrified by the violation of her home, which no longer felt like a safe private haven it used to be, Donna moved in with her sister Trisha. She became friends with Julia, one of Trisha's neighbours, and it turned out that Julia had recently faced a similar nightmare. She had returned home from vacation to find her belongings slashed and her pictures and clothing shredded. Like Donna, she had no enemies and no idea who would have done it and why. In light of what happened next, Donna and Julia soon realised what a narrow escape they had had. Elizabeth Stevens had been living in foster care in Tasmania for the last four years, but when she turned 18 in January 1993, she moved in with her auntie Rita and uncle Paul in Patterson Avenue, Frankston. Elizabeth was studious and hardworking, and as she hadn't yet made any friends in the area, she spent most of her time alone or at the college library. On Friday the 11th of June, Rita and Paul arrived home from work to find a note on the kitchen table from their niece, telling them she'd gone to the library to study and would be back by 8pm. This wasn't out of the ordinary, so her aunt and uncle went about their evening as usual. When 8pm came and went, they anxiously tried to convince themselves that Elizabeth had caught a later bus or had lost track of time. But when she still hadn't arrived by 10, they were extremely worried. Paul went out in his car to look for Elizabeth while Rita stayed at home in case she turned up or tried to phone. It was raining with poor visibility, but squinting desperately into the night, Paul followed the bus route she would have taken and even drove to her college, but there was no sign of her. They called the police. Sergeant Webster arrived at 1am and was deeply troubled, as Paul and Rita assured him this was very out of character for their niece. There hadn't been any arguments, and she didn't know anyone locally who she could be with. Police immediately searched the surrounding area, and left instructions for the daytime shift to continue at daybreak. The next morning, the search didn't last for long. A man called Rod was on a morning stroll in Lloyd Park, a recreation spot popular for dog walking, barbecues, and as a children's playground. As he walked along a track amongst the trees, Rod got the shock of his life. Leaning in closer, heart in his mouth, he checked again, praying he was mistaken. He wasn't. Half hidden under some branches and leaves was a body. It was Elizabeth Stevens. Police secured the harrowing crime scene. Elizabeth had been choked unconscious before being stabbed in the stomach multiple times in a crisscross pattern and her nose was broken as if someone had stamped on her face. There was no sign of sexual assault. Paul and Rita's house backed onto the park, so when they looked out of the window and noticed the flashing lights of the converging police cars, it was disturbingly clear that something terrible had happened. Before they even received a knock on the door, heralding the dreadful news, they instinctively knew they would never see their niece again. Police suspected someone had followed Elizabeth off the bus, as a stop wasn't far from Lloyd Park. Frustratingly, forensics yielded nothing thanks to the previous night's rain, but they did find a knife blade which had broken off in the violent attack, although it offered no fingerprints. They interviewed students from the college, focusing on those with criminal records, but nothing came up. As far as anyone could tell, it was a random, motiveless killing. The police were very proactive in their hunt for the murderer, 
setting up a roadblock around the bus stop, handing out pamphlets to spread the word and using a mannequin. This is a tool commonly used in Australia and the UK, where a dummy is dressed in clothes similar to those the victim was wearing and placed at the time and location they were last seen, in the hope of jogging someone's memory. Many tips were phoned in, but none led to anything solid. With no forensic evidence and no suspects, the investigation had reached a dead end. Almost a month later, on July the 8th, 1993, 41-year-old Rosa Toth took the train home from work, getting off at Seaford Station at 5.50pm. As she passed Seaford Reserve, a grassy, tree-lined picnic area and playground, she noticed a tall, bulky man lurking near the toilet block. This didn't worry her at first, because there were still people around, but bear in mind that Australia's seasons are opposite to the Northern Hemisphere, so July is winter, and it would have been dark at that time. As Rosa walked by the toilet block, the man suddenly grabbed her from behind, covering her mouth and dragging her to the ground near the grassy area. She desperately tried to fight him off, so he threatened her with a fake gun, saying, Shut up or I'll kill you! But he wasn't the only one who could pretend. Rosa cleverly acted as though she was complying with his demand, and when he dropped his guard, she kicked out and managed to escape. She ran as fast as she could, heart racing as she screamed for help, propelled by the adrenaline rushing through her body. She knew she was in a race for her life. Her attacker fled in the opposite direction from the road, towards the grassy reserve, and thankfully, Rosa was able to flag down a passing car, and the driver took her home. She was very shaken by her ordeal, but was lucky to escape with minor cuts and bruises. When Rosa recounted her distressing experience to the police, she described her attacker as almost six feet tall, with blue eyes and a round face, and he had been wearing a black jacket and beanie hat. She thought his fake gun was some sort of wooden object held against her, and she'd immediately suspected it wasn't real. Her quick thinking had undoubtedly saved her life. In a chilling echo of the Jack the Ripper double event in 1888, when the perpetrator was interrupted in the middle of one murder and went on to kill another on the same night to satiate his bloodlust, the Frankston killer was not ready to give up. Around 7pm, Debbie Freem was at home cooking dinner in Cannonook Avenue, Seaford, blissfully unaware that a murderer was on the prowl. She was making omelette for herself and a friend, Russell Hayes, who was watching her two-week-old baby while she cooked. Her boyfriend, Gary, was at work. She realised they were out of milk, so she told Russell she was going to the local shop in her grey Datsun Pulsar and would be back in five minutes. When half an hour had passed, Russell felt uneasy. Surely it shouldn't be taking so long. He told himself that maybe the shop was shut and she'd have to drive further along to the next one. But when an hour passed with no sign of Debbie, he was frantic. He couldn't go out and look for her as he wasn't familiar with the area and he couldn't leave the baby alone. So he rang the local police and hospitals in case there'd been an accident, but there hadn't. Next, he phoned Gary to break the alarming news. Gary arranged for a babysitter to look after the child while he and Russell drove around searching for Debbie. While researching this case, I looked up Cannonook Avenue on Google Maps and it's a pleasant, tree-lined suburban street, somewhere you just wouldn't imagine something like this could happen, which really proves that abductions and murder can take place anywhere. As I clicked down the road on Street View, a blue brick building caught my eye called Peter's Cannonook Corner Store which could be where Debbie was heading to buy milk. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and it's true. Somehow, seeing a photo of a place where something terrible happened brings it to life, so much more poignantly than reading about it ever can. Gary and Russell searched everywhere before they reached the troubling decision to go to the police. Debbie was officially a missing person. Officers soon suspected that her disappearance could be linked to the assault on Rosa Toth an hour or so before and only a mile away. Witnesses reported seeing a grey pulsar driving erratically nearby and flashing its lights, 
so it sounded like Debbie had been abducted and was trying to attract attention. The next day, her car was found two kilometres away, abandoned outside the Christian centre. The front passenger door was unlocked and there was a dent in the bonnet which Gary confirmed had not been there before. Their worst fears were confirmed when the forensic team found blood inside. They also found a small clue, which was the killer's first mistake. He had pushed the driver's seat all the way back, proving that he was a tall man, as Debbie was short and always kept the seat much closer to the wheel. This made it even more likely it was the same man who attacked Rosa Toth, as she had judged him to be around six feet tall. It wasn't much to go on, but it was something. However, there was still no sign of Debbie. Four days later, grappling with fear, grief and the responsibility of raising his two-week-old baby alone, Gary received the news he'd been dreading, but had already known deep down to be true. A farmer in Carrum Downs, a desolate area about a 15-minute drive away, had found a body underneath some leaves as he was checking his fence line. At first he thought it was a dummy, planted there by a neighbour, as a distasteful prank. But he soon realised it was no joke. Debbie Freem had been strangled and stabbed repeatedly. She had defensive wounds on her hands and arms, but had not been sexually assaulted. There was still no useful forensic evidence, but police now knew for sure that the murders of Debbie Freem and Elizabeth Stevens were linked, along with the assault of Rosa Toth. Detectives consulted a police officer who spent over a year training as an FBI profiler at Quantico, Virginia, and a profile of the killer was drawn up. They believed he was between 18 and 24, unemployed or working in a menial job, lived locally in the Frankston area and probably alone, and was acting out a long-held fantasy of murder. There's been a lot of criticism of profiling over the years, with many labelling it as a pseudoscience, arguing that it's more common sense and logic than a special ability to predict a killer's personality. Much of the knowledge base that profilers rely on was developed by the FBI's John Douglas and Robert Ressler, who conducted about 30 unstructured interviews with California serial killers in the 70s to get a feel of their character traits and whether they were organised or disorganised. This is a very small sample size, and as they yielded qualitative rather than empirical data, its credibility has been questioned. To identify a killer as organised, profilers look for evidence of methodical thinking, planning the crime in advance, and the ability to employ a ruse to gain the victim's trust. Organised killers are also more likely to be intelligent, have a job, and be in a relationship whereas disorganised killers may be unemployed, live alone or with parents, and attacks may be random and unplanned. In reality, killers often have a combination of these traits. In the case of the Frankston killer, the profile implies a disorganised killer with no job or a menial job and living alone. Although elements of this later turned out to be true, the crimes were very clearly planned, which we'll see in more detail later. Now there had been two murders and an assault, fear was stalking the streets of Frankston. Women were advised not to travel alone at night, and enthusiastic media coverage stirred up even more anxiety. People stayed indoors, looked over their shoulders, and even treated neighbours with suspicion. They were right to be worried. Three weeks later, on July the 13th, a postal worker delivering mail in Sky Road not far from the crime scenes, noticed a battered old yellow Toyota Corona with no number plates parked near a bike track at around 2.30pm. The track led from Sky Road to Frankston North and was adjacent to a golf course with a high wire fence along the boundary, overgrown with dense foliage. As the postal worker walked past, she noticed a chubby man slouched down in the car with a cap pulled over his face as if he was trying not to be seen. She sensed something was off, and given that the recent murders were all over the news and on everyone's mind, she called the police before continuing on her round. Her suspicions were correct. The man in the car was the Frankston killer. 
Unfortunately, the police arrived too late. He had already spotted his next victim, 17-year-old schoolgirl Natalie Russell, who was on her way home from school a little earlier than usual as she'd been given a free period so she was planning to study at home for an upcoming exam. Just a couple of days before, the school principal had warned students not to use the bike track because of the murders in the area. But it was broad daylight, so Natalie must have assumed it would be safe and it would get her home much faster than walking the long way round. When the police arrived in response to the postal worker's call, they found the yellow Toyota, but there was nobody in it. They knocked on doors in the neighbourhood, but nobody could offer any information about the man who owned it. Although there was no number plate, they did take note of the registration sticker on the car, but that was all they had time for. They were called away to a robbery and thought no more of the seemingly abandoned vehicle. Unbelievably, the police were agonisingly close to catching the killer in the act, and had they been a few minutes earlier or had time to scour the scene more closely, it's possible they could have saved Natalie Russell's life. The first indication that something was wrong was when some children coming out of school later that afternoon spotted a shoe near a hole in the fence by the bike track. Another child noticed a man walking very quickly towards him which scared him, but the man walked past without saying a word, hiding his face and with his hands stuffed into his pockets. Soon, Natalie's parents raised the alarm when she was late arriving home. Police returned to the bike track and saw that holes had been cut into the wire fence. Climbing through into the undergrowth, they found her body. She had multiple defensive injuries, had been stabbed repeatedly, and like the others, had not been sexually assaulted. As night had fallen, police chose to delay the search for forensic evidence until the next day, which proved fruitful. Skin and tissue were found in one of Natalie's wounds, and the pathologist concluded the attack had been vicious and frenzied, but she had put up a vigorous fright, managed to pull out some of her attacker's hair. Investigators were also hopeful that when they found the suspect, they could match the cuts in the fence to a tool in his possession. It was clear that they had to speak to the owner of the yellow Toyota as soon as possible. They traced the registration sticker and found that the owner was Paul Charles Denyer. On July 31st, police visited his home at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road in Seaford, which he shared with his girlfriend Sharon. Nobody was home, but they left a deliberately vague note requesting Paul's attendance at Frankston's police station to assist with a routine inquiry so as not to arouse his suspicion. In an interesting coincidence, Denya lived next door to Trisha, Donovan's sister. You might remember I mentioned earlier that one of her neighbours, Julia, had suffered a similar break-in and damage to her property, like Donna had. Little did they know that the man responsible for the prank calls, the break-ins and the slaughter of Donna's cats was also the serial killer that was terrorising Frankston and he lived in the same street. It would later emerge that when Donna had first moved in with Trisha, Paul Denya had the nerve to welcome her to the neighbourhood and reassured her she would be safe there and that if the police caught who was responsible, he would personally take care of them for her. When Denya arrived at the police station, detectives had a hunch about him straight away. He matched the witness descriptions, had cuts on his fingers and was in the vicinity of all three murder sites. They questioned him extensively, but he remained calm and composed throughout. He had an answer for everything, even a detailed story about how he got his hand caught in the fan while fixing his car to explain the cuts. It was all a pack of lies. Here's a clip from the real interview, which can also be found as a video on YouTube. Before continuing, I must inform you that you're not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? Yeah. What is your age and date of birth? I'm 21 years old. I was born on the 14th of April 1972. Okay. Are you an Australian citizen? Yep. Are you currently employed? No, I'm unemployed at the present time. All we'd like to do, Paul, is if you could just run through, um, starting with yesterday morning. I got up in the morning about 
20 to 8, 7.30, 20 to 8. Right. As I was coming down, say, past Coringal Drive, mm -hmm. I noticed temperature gauge started to go right up to high. So I just pulled over and in Sky Road. Road yeah. And right across the road is, you know, your golf course and, yeah. and everything. So I pulled up there and I checked under the car, under the bonnet, and found out the hose could come loose. When we saw you down at your flat this afternoon, mm. I noticed a number of cuts on your fingers. Yeah. Can you just um, put your hands flat on the desk here, so that um, just right up here. This injury here is a long uh, sort of a cut. Just explain how you got that injury and when you got that injury. I got it yesterday when I was working on the car. Well, how are you saying it occurred? Well, the fan spins this way, yeah. so if I'm standing at the front of the car, yeah. like here, yeah. fan yeah. spins that way, the alternator sits there, yeah. and there's some wires running down underneath the bottom of the radiator, there's a wire at the top, mm. which was for a light that I just recently put on, and it must have been when I was putting my hand down there, I caught the fan. <clears throat> Why did you have it running uh, at that stage, when you were checking the well, radiator? Clumsy worker, on cars. The investigator then asked him directly if he had anything to do with the deaths of the three women. He replied no, and then calmly asked for a cup of coffee. Your car was parked opposite the location where the body of Natalie Russell was found. Mm -hmm. On the night that Debbie Freem disappeared, you walked over to Kenilworth Railway Station, missed the train and walked back. Mm -hmm. And on the night Elizabeth Stevens mm -hmm. disappeared, you walked in a very close proximity to Lloyd Park on your way to pick up this battery. Do you think that's fairly coincidental yeah, well, it is. in all the, all the circumstances? Yeah. Are you responsible for the deaths of any of these women? No. Well, we'll just going to suspend the interview for a short time. Mm. Is there anything else you want, like a cup of coffee or a glass yeah, of water? Yeah, I would like another cup of coffee. Yeah. How do you have your coffee? Uh, white with two. All right, I'll get you a cup of coffee, all right? Aware they were getting nowhere with this smooth operator, police requested a sample of his hair and blood, and Denya asked whether they had any DNA from the crime scene to compare it to, obviously weighing up the odds of getting away with murder. When they replied in the affirmative, the suspect realised his time was up. After a few moments thought, he dispassionately stated, OK, I killed all three of them. I think Denny is a pretty smart guy because he's obviously weighed up the evidence in his mind and he's thinking, well, they've got this evidence against me. Maybe if I confess to the crimes, it will result in them going easy on me when it comes to actual sentencing. His extensive confessions were spoken with a lack of emotion that chilled the detectives to the bone. He had said he had followed Elizabeth Stevens off the bus and then grabbed her from behind telling her he had a gun, but it was just a piece of aluminium piping with a wooden handle. He then marched the terrified girl to Lloyd Park, warning her that if she screamed or tried to run away, he would kill her. I walked up behind her, stuck my left hand around her, ran her mouth like this and held her a gun to my head right here. I started choking her with my hands and uh, she passed out after a while, and then I pulled out the knife, okay. and I dragged her to where she was found. Then I threw two branches on her body. When asked why he attacked Elizabeth Stevens that night, he replied, Just... Just had... Just had the feeling, that's all. Where, what sort of feeling can you... Possibly describe it, where, where you had this feeling? Just wanted... Just wanted to kill. His voice was cold and empty of remorse. He answered the detective's questions almost condescendingly, as if he knew he was in control of the situation, because he was the only one who knew what had happened. To their horror... He even demonstrated the stabbing motions he had used and how his victim had begun shaking and shuddering as she neared death. 
He described how he then dragged Elizabeth's body to the spot where it was ultimately found and left behind the blade of his homemade knife which had bent and broken away from the handle during the attack. He went on to describe the murder of Debbie Freem, who had simply left her house to buy milk and had no idea that the five-minute journey would be her last, leaving her two-week-old baby to grow up without a mother. Denya told officers he had got into the back of her car while she was in the shop, crouching down to avoid being spotted. He said, While well, I was crouched down, I could hear her footsteps coming closer to the car. Mm-hmm. And she hopped in the car, but she didn't see me in the back. And she went to do a U-turn, pulled out the gun that I had, just as she was doing that turn. She kept going straight into this wall. What did she hit? Could be there. He told Debbie where to drive, threatening to blow her head off if she tried to give a signal to anyone. He directed her to a secluded area, forced her out of the car, and strangled her with a length of cord. He then took a knife from his sock and stabbed her in the neck and chest. When she fell limp, he continued to stab her, this time in the stomach, pulling up her sweater first so he could watch his grisly handiwork. When he was sure she was dead, he dragged Debbie's body to a clump of trees and covered it with branches dumped a car where it was later found, then walked home in time to collect his girlfriend Sharon from Cananook Station. What a nasty piece of work. The next day, he brazenly returned to Debbie's car and took her person shopping. He emptied the milk she'd brought down the sink, threw away the eggs and burnt the carton before burying her purse on a nearby golf course and then dismantling his homemade knife hiding the parts in an air vent in his basement. With these details in mind, the murders were very clearly premeditated and show that Denya had many traits of an organised killer. Finally, he confessed to the murder of Natalie Russell, admitting that he had planned to abduct any young woman who came walking along the bike track. Earlier in the day, he had surveyed the spot and cut three holes in the wire fence with pliers big enough for himself and his victim to fit through, strategically hidden by the trees. He told police how he put his left hand around Natalie's mouth and held his knife to her throat, which is how he got the cut on his thumb. The only time Denya showed any emotion during his harrowing tale was when he said that Natalie had offered herself to him for sex in exchange for her life. He shook his head as he repeated this to the police, as if he was disgusted. She asked him what he wanted from her, and he said, All I want you to do is shut up. If you don't shut up, I'll kill you. He then strangled her with a leather strap before cutting her throat, a motion which Denya unblinkingly demonstrated in the interview room. As if we didn't already have enough proof that Denya was a highly organised killer, he admitted that when he saw police taking details From his car registration sticker, he turned around and walked calmly away, washed his clothes and hid the murder weapon in his backyard and spent a quiet evening with Sharon at her mother's place after picking her up from work. When asked why he had murdered the three women, he said he just wanted to take a life because he felt his life had been taken many times. He then said he just hated women. When police asked him to clarify whether he hated those particular women or women in general, he replied, general. Another phrase he used when asked about his motive was, I just wanted to. Denya was charged with the murders of Elizabeth Stevens, Debbie Freem and Natalie Russell and the attempted abduction of Rosa Toff. At the trial on December 15th, 1993, he pleaded guilty on all counts. Clinical psychologist Dr Ian Joblin told the court that Denya showed no remorse for his crimes and had revelled in describing the murders. He testified that he had assessed many offenders over the years, but not one of them came close to Denya. He said, He is a rare breed, a killer who murders at random without motive. 
and this makes him the most dangerous sort of killer. He has a cruel and demeaning nature, and has exhibited aggressive behaviour since his childhood. He seemed amused by the suffering he inflicted, and I believe there is no cure for his sadistic personality disorder. Paul Denyer was sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment, with an additional eight years for the abduction charge. Justice Vincent, presiding, said, The apprehension you have caused to thousands of women in the community will be felt for a long time. For many, you are the fear that quickens their step as they walk home, or causes a parent to look anxiously at the clock when their child is late. Originally, the sentence did not allow for a set parole period, so Denya should have spent the rest of his life behind bars. But after a Supreme Court appeal, he was granted a 30-year parole period, which means he could walk free in 2023. The families of his victims felt betrayed by the court's decision, and they are not the only ones concerned about his possible release. While researching this case, I stumbled across a Facebook group called True Story of Serial Killer Paul Denya, run by his sister-in-law Julie, who is married to his eldest brother David. Julie strongly believes that Paul should never see the light of day and is still a danger to women everywhere. In her posts, she recalled him stalking her in the two years prior to the murders, staring menacingly through her window at night and even threatening to kill her and her children. The experiences were so traumatic that Julie and David moved their family to the UK, where Julie was originally born, and where they still live today, despite their dream to retire in Australia. So what was Paul Denyer's story, and what made him become a serial killer? He was born on April 14th, 1972, to Maureen and Anthony Denyer, who left Britain in 1965 to start a new life in Australia. Paul had four brothers and one sister, and it didn't take long for clues to surface and marked him out as very different from his siblings. He didn't socialise well with other children, although he settled into his primary school fairly well. But when the family relocated to Victoria in 1981 for Anthony's new job, it was a seismic shift for Paul who struggled to adjust to his new surroundings and school. One of his teachers would later say that despite not having friends, he seemed to have an extraordinary amount of inner confidence, which Dr Ian Joblin later identified as narcissistic personality disorder. As a child, Denya made a hobby of slitting the throats of his sister's toy bears, and when that was no longer satisfying enough, he used his brother's pocket knife to do the same to the family cat before hanging it from a tree. He developed an unhealthy interest in knives, guns and catapults, became even more of a loner and got into trouble for making prank calls to the fire brigade. There had also been an incident at school when he had assaulted a student who was chewing a pen at the time, resulting in the pen being lodged in the victim's throat. Pretty nasty stuff. He was nicknamed John Candy after the comedy actor due to his overweight frame. And as he grew older, he moved on to car theft and was obsessed with blood and gore, watching films like Fear, Halloween and The Stepfather over and over. Now you've all probably seen the movie Halloween, but the other two, Fear and Stepfather, probably not as well known, but back in the day, they were considered very, very violent. By today's standards, however, they would probably get a certificate 15. If you haven't seen them already, worth checking out. The stepfather has the actor Terry O'Quinn, who was in Lost, and I believe they made a sequel a few years later, which starred the late Jonathan Brandis, who would later go on to star in Stephen King's It. Anyway, check those out if you haven't already. He admitted he'd felt the urge to kill since the age of 14, and had been waiting for a silent alarm to trigger him. As he grew older, the trouble continued at his workplaces. At one, he allegedly killed two goats in a paddock next door and later lost his job at Safeway when he knocked down a woman and a child with a convoy of shopping trolleys. 
It was there that he met his girlfriend Sharon Johnson in 1992, who he later moved in with, a relationship that appeared surprisingly normal. He told the police, She's not like anyone else I know. I'd never hurt her. She's a kindred spirit. Denya applied to join the police force, but was deemed unfit due to his weight, and his final place of work before the murders was a marine workshop, which fired him for spending too much time making daggers and knives rather than the job he was paid to do. Due to his continued unemployment, he had a lot of time on his hands, and as Sharon was working two jobs, she wasn't at home much to notice what Paul was getting up to. Maybe it was losing yet another job that was the trigger for him to finally feed his thirst for blood, or maybe, after years of waiting, the silent alarm in his mind didn't need a reason to go off. Given the indications in Denya's early life, like cutting up stuffed toys, killing the family cat, a fixation with violent films, and even assaulting a child at school, it's not much of a surprise that he eventually graduated to murder. However, it did seem to come as a surprise to his parents, who, as far as I can tell from my research, failed to take any action about their son's glaringly obvious deviant behaviour. We begin to understand why they didn't seek any help for Paul when we examine the environment he and his siblings grew up in. On her Facebook page, his sister-in-law Julie stated that Anthony Denya, Paul's father, was abusive to his family and even friends and neighbours had noticed that he was unusually possessive and dominant. She went on to say that Maureen did her best to be there for the children, but it would have been impossible to provide enough support in such a toxic household. Some sources claim that Paul fell on his head as a child, but Julie has refuted this, explaining that this misunderstanding stems from a phrase used within the family. When someone was being silly, they would say, it must be because he was dropped on his head as a baby. This isn't meant literally, but was an expression popular in the UK several decades ago, and could be used to describe someone who, for example, clumsily drops things or acts in a way that others perceive as odd. If he really had fallen on his head, then this would pave the way for neurological explanations as to why he became a killer, as there is some evidence that frontal lobe damage can predispose a person to violent criminal behaviour. If this isn't the case after all, then we have to look at reasons that lie within nurture rather than nature. While in prison, Denya underwent counselling and came to terms with the gender dysphoria he realised he'd been experiencing since his childhood, explaining that he wanted to live as a woman. Despite several appeals, he was denied hormonal treatment to change his biological sex, but he began his own process of transitioning from male to female, changing his name to Paula and wearing women's clothes. I'm sure most people would agree it was the right decision not to spend taxpayers' money on a sex change for a convicted murderer. However, what doesn't sit well with me is the extreme vitriol that I've seen on the internet when people talk about his request. Although he may not deserve sympathy, I do believe that the best way to separate yourself from people like Denya and show the real meaning of humanity is not to perpetuate hatred. My belief is that humans are not intrinsically born to kill, and the majority of murderers, if not all, are moulded by their environment. But I accept there may be a missing neurological or biological link somewhere to explain why not everyone growing up in bad circumstances turns out the same way. American neuroscientist James Fallon believes that people can have a genetic predisposition to violent behaviour, but it takes a trigger or a particular environment to bring it out. According to the recoveryvillage.com, children who develop gender dysphoria, or in other words, a perception that the gender they were born with isn't right, may display gender-crossing behaviour as early as age two, while others may not experience it until puberty. There are various influencing factors such as genetics, hormones and environment. The website quotes a research study that found 56% of participants with gender dysphoria had experienced several traumatic life events and 46% displayed signs of disorganised attachment. 
What does that mean? Well, signs of disorganised attachment include difficulty in socialising with peers, inability to manage stress, and demonstrating hostile and aggressive behaviour. So why would somebody have this problem? Someone with disorganised attachment probably had a caregiver or parent who failed to create a safe, secure environment for them, did not provide appropriate, comforting responses to their distress at an early age, or made the child fear them. To me, this sounds like Paul Denier's youth, growing up with an abusive father, and according to Paul himself, sexual abuse by one of his brothers. And this could have had an impact on his developing gender dysphoria and subsequent aggression. And here's another horrifying statistic. As many as 50% of people with gender dysphoria attempt suicide, probably due to social stigma, rejection, discrimination, bullying and violence that they commonly experience. It's obvious that the distress of dysphoria, particularly when feeling that nobody understands them, can manifest as a very unhealthy mental state. If it can so easily lead to suicidal thoughts, is it too much of a stretch to imagine it could lead to homicidal thoughts too? Denya himself also explains his actions this way. I'll continue to refer to Denya as him for the avoidance of confusion as he was presenting as male at the time of the murders. There is a series of scanned letters on the internet which he wrote from prison between 2003 and 2004, which give us a unique insight into his mind. In his own words, I'll put the source in the show notes as usual. Some parts had been censored before they were uploaded, but judging from what's left, they appear to have been written to another inmate who he'd become friends with, who had been moved to another unit or block, so they communicated by letter. Here are some extracts spoken by a voice actor. Leading up to my 30th birthday, the suppression began to take its toll upon me. I had some friends here that I hung around doing boy sings. I was never happy trying to fit into those clothes. But my feelings kept gnawing away at me. Then I decided being male just wasn't working anymore. I gracefully chose to change my appearance as what I could without breaking prison rules. I began to feel a lot freer, having relationships that religion and my circle of associates prevented. Through contemplation and counselling, I began to look over my whole life and Yes, not feeling I've belonged to this body has been the reason many things have gone wrong. 30 years I've been a stranger to myself. I picked up on that word envious that you use to describe your thoughts towards other females. That's how I felt. I tried to emulate my brothers who were older than me, but each time I failed. I was heckled and made to feel that I was so wrong in everything. I haven't had contact with my brothers for 10 years. So, they're not open to talk to me. I imagine they think I'm a freak. For some time, I believe that too. In another letter, he describes how media coverage of his gender transition affected his mental health and explains why he committed the murders. The emotions hit me hard the last time my case hit the papers. I hit rock bottom once again and was prescribed antidepressants. I honestly didn't know if you would write back to me after all the coverage. Not that I blame anyone for not understanding. It's been hard for me to understand too. I committed those disgusting crimes, not because I ever hated womankind, but because I never really felt that I was male, which leaves female the other side of the human race. Unfortunately for me, I used the word hate when the police interviewed me because hate was the only emotion I thought I could correctly identify with my confused identity. I always felt like something else, but wanted to destroy that because it was too hard to deal with. I've put the pieces together like this. A. Born feeling like the other sex. B. Growing up interested in female things. C. Fearing adulthood as male. D. Having to suppress my feelings. E committing these crimes to try to destroy those feelings. The mother of one of the victims said that Denia's transition made her feel sick and called it a stunt. 
it must be indescribably painful for her to live with the loss of her daughter, whose life was cut so cruelly short, while the person who took it from her has the luxury of expressing himself as he wishes. But a prisoner support group has argued that Denya could not be anything but serious about wanting to live as a woman, as choosing that lifestyle in prison would put him at significant risk of violence from other inmates. If we take the desire for transition and the contents of the letters at face value, it may point to some of the complex mental processes that were going on in Denya's mind. Just to be clear, this is not about empathy for murderers, but I believe that if we simply label people as evil and don't try to get into their heads, then as a society we're missing a massive opportunity to understand what makes people kill, and the natural extension of that understanding is learning how we can stop it happening again in the future. Based on what we've heard about Denier's childhood, I think his abusive home life and a feeling of being different could have been contributing factors. In his letter he mentioned being mocked by his brothers when he tried to be like them and feeling like a freak. The question in my mind is, with a more supportive family around him who immediately sought help or counselling when he exhibited the first worrying signs, along with a better understanding in society of gender issues, is it possible that Elizabeth Stevens, Debbie Freem and Natalie Russell might still be alive today? His sister-in-law Julie would say no, and that Paul's actions were nobody's fault but his own. She also posted a picture on her Facebook group of a letter she received from him, signed off with the cryptic words, have a nice life, see you in the next one. Is this simply a reference to not wanting anything to do with his family, or does it imply a sinister threat? If so, it seems unlikely it would have got past prison censors. Many people, including Julie, believe that Paul Denyer was also responsible for the disappearance of 23-year-old Sarah McDarmid, who vanished from Kananook Railway Station in 1990. Police are convinced she was abducted and murdered, but her body has never been found. A witness reported hearing a woman say, Give me my car keys back and stop fooling around, at the station on the evening she went missing, followed by a scream. The witness looked everywhere, but couldn't see anyone, or even any signs of a disturbance. Thirty years later, the case remains unsolved but open, as police are determined to continue seeking the truth. Denya was on the original suspect list, along with cop killer Banderly Debs and sex worker Jody Jones, who once stabbed a man to death with her stiletto heels. But that was around the time Denya was stalking Julie, and by his own admission, other women in the Frankston area. It seems out of sequence for him to kill once in 1990, then de-escalate to stalking and threats, before waiting to ramp back up again to murder in 1993. Also, whilst he did try to cover up the bodies of his three known victims, they were found quickly, so it would be outside of his MO to hide Sarah McDermott so effectively that her remains have never been found. But until her murder is solved, Denya must still be considered a possible suspect. David Denya, Paul's oldest brother, said, I've never tried to justify his actions. He deserves everything he gets. He should stay in prison and he should never be allowed to re-enter society, ever. His wife Julie agreed, regretful that they don't feel able to safely return to the country they still consider home. I wish to retire to Australia, the place I miss with all my heart. What Paul did was life-changing to me, and to this day affects my life in so many ways. The families of the three victims echo her feelings, forever living with the aftermath of having their loved ones brutally snatched away at ages 17, 18 and 22. The bike track near Sky Road has been renamed Nat's Track in memory of Natalie Russell, whose life was cut short as she walked home from school. But even without this memorial, her name, along with Elizabeth Stevens and Debbie Freem, will remain written in the hearts of their families and Frankston forever. 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Prasha's Murder Map. And a big thank you to those who have recently left me reviews. Dylan, Jess, MNC Dover and Kevin. I really appreciate it. If you know anyone who may enjoy this podcast, please spread the word. You can also email me with comments or case suggestions for future episodes to prashersmurdermap at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at prashersmurdermap, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Join me next time in Montreal as we ask the question, what made Mark Lapine despise successful women so much that his fermenting hatred finally erupted in a hail of bullets in the most notorious mass shooting in Canadian history?